Hello everyone, welcome dear English teachers in Peru and teachers around the world. Welcome to today's webinar. The topic today is instructed listening and we are so happy to have you here again. Now, please remember that you can follow us. Okay, we have our Facebook, WhatsApp, Telegram, YouTube, TikTok, and please Dear English teachers, join us. And now, before to start with this presentation, we are going to consider some instructions in order to participate in today's webinar. First, please type your questions in the comment section. The answer to your questions and comments will be replied by our guest speaker at the end of the webinar in the question time section. And about the exit ticket, dear, dear English teachers, please remember that when finishing the webinar, we will share a link for you to have access to the exit ticket, which will be available for 15 minutes. Remember that it's important that you have to complete this exit ticket, okay? And now we are going to know our guest speaker. Please, dear Miriam Cordova, are you there? Could you introduce him, please? Hi, Miss. Good evening, everyone. My pleasure to present to a great speaker tonight. We have to a great speaker whose which name is Cesar Pablo. He is a 42-year-old teacher, teacher trainer, examiner, and academic coordinator. He has been involved in language teaching for almost half of his life in both teaching and management positions in private language schools and university language centers. He's currently working as a teacher evaluation specialist at Instituto Cultural Peruano Norteamericano in Lima, Peru. 
He has a bachelor's degree in education with a major in teaching English and Spanish. Also, he got his double diploma master's in applied linguistics in teaching English as a foreign language for, from Universidad Europea del Atlántico and Universidad Internacional Iberoamérica, based in Spain and Mexico, respectively. Finally, he's currently taking the Doctor of Education program at the Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos, where he also got his bachelor's degree. My pleasure to present you, so amazing speaker, Cesar Pablo. Welcome to this webinar. The audience is yours. Thank you very much, Miriam. Thank you. So I think it's my time now to share my screen. Just give me a second. Okay. Well, thank you very much one more time, everybody here at the, um, it's a very uh, nice uh, time here in Lima, Peru, I think. And uh, we, I know that we not only have teachers from Peru, but also from other countries. So I hope everybody has a great learning experience in today's, in today's session. Okay. So um, today's topic is instructed listening, which is basically teaching listening or listening that we do in the classroom, okay? And uh, what we're going to do basically is explore both challenges and opportunities of this uh, topic, instructed listening, okay? Well, you know my name already, and let's go ahead and see what we got today. First, we have to start with the end in mind, as uh, Stephen uh, Covey says, right? We need to have the objective for this session. And the objective we want to uh, pursue is this, okay? By the end of this webinar, participants, all of you, participants will be able to reflect. That is something I aim at. We'll be able to reflect on the challenges and opportunities for instructed L2 listening by analyzing two listening challenges and offering solutions to each one, okay? So that's what we are going to do in this session. It's gonna be about one hour or maybe one hour and a half long. So I hope you all enjoy this, this webinar, okay? And something very important, uh, what I'm gonna present today is not like uh, mm -hmm. a separate topic. It's not something different from what has been presented in other webinars in this uh, series. Well, I, I will try to connect, in fact, with uh, the topics presented so far, not only this year, but also the ones presented last year, okay? Well, um, let's see. We're gonna get started by um, reflecting, okay? That is, I think, something very important to reflect on our assumptions, our beliefs in terms of uh, teaching listening. For that, you're gonna to have two tools. The first one is Poll Everywhere. The lucky ones will actually have a chance to participate and they will see the responses live on Poll Everywhere. And uh, those who cannot join Poll Everywhere, they can participate by um, responding, by answering the questions in the Google Forms that one of the uh, admins of this amazing community will share in just a moment, okay? Um, and of course, you can always participate in the live chat in YouTube, okay? I'm gonna look at your answers also in the live chat in YouTube, okay? Here we go. Uh, so what I said before is very important, not only uh, at the beginning, but also in the middle of the learning process, also at the end, right? Reflecting is very important when it comes to, uh, let's say, building up on what we just maybe experienced, what we uh, believe, for example, and everything like that. So reflecting on our own experience and approach in teaching L2 listening. Let's see, I'm gonna show you uh, some of the uh, assumptions or beliefs we might have about teaching listening, and then we'll do the, the poll or the survey, okay? First, compared, compared with other language skills, listening is a passive activity. What do you think about that? What are your assumptions about that? Okay, do you agree, disagree? We'll see that in just a moment. Second, the most important thing in listening instruction is that students get the right answer. You play the recording, they listen to that, and then they complete 
the sentence or they answer the question. So getting the right answer, is that what is listening about? We'll see that in just a moment too. Next, learner anxiety is a major obstacle in L2 listening. The emotional aspect, okay, we'll explore that. Your beliefs, your assumptions regarding that, um, that statement there. Four, listening means understanding words. So teachers just need to help learners understand all the words or every word in the sound stream. Is that what, you, what we have to aim at when teaching listening? We'll see your, your beliefs in just a moment. Next, uh, teaching listening through video is better than audio alone, right? I think a lot of people use YouTube. In fact, TED Talks and many other video uh, sources to teach or resources to teach listening. Is that better than audio alone? We'll see also in just a moment. Okay, I think something happened here. All right, I think I'm back. Let me fix this, probably something happened. Okay, having some technical issues, just please give me a second. Let me see if I can fix it. Um, all right. Yes, I'm back, I think. Okay. Well, uh, number six, learners with good listening ability in their first language, in Spanish or any other first language people have, will also become good L2 listeners. What, what are your beliefs about that? Seven, when teachers provide learners with the context for a listening activity, they give away too much information. Number eight, interactive listening, conversation with another speaker, is more difficult than one-way listening. For example, listening to the radio and television. What do you think about that? Number nine, letting students listen on their own. In other words, extensive listening, according to their interests, is the best way to help or to develop listening skills. What do you think about that? And number 10, captions and subtitles are, help, are useful or helpful, okay? Well, I found these uh, statements, um, questions to reflect actually on this very interesting book by Larry Vandergrift and Christine C.M. Gaw, Teaching and Learning Second Language Listening, Metacognition in Action. And metacognition is something I'm gonna refer to extensively in this in this session, by the way, okay? So let's see. Uh, all right, so um, there are some actually few, in fact, lucky ones who'll be able to participate and see the responses live on the Poll Everywhere um, application. So if you have the application on your cell phone, you can use it right now, pollev.com slash cpablo710. Just putting cpablo710 to access and then, of course, see your answers in this uh, in this application. Okay, for those who cannot join Poll Everywhere. Oh, by the way, you can also you can also open Poll Everywhere on the web. That's okay, or use the the application as I mentioned. Okay, and uh, for those who cannot join Poll Everywhere, you can of course use the link that one of the uh, members of this community will share in just a moment, okay? Well, in any case, the idea is to reflect on our own experience and approach in teaching L2, L2 listening, all right? So please give me a second, I need to change the, the screen. Okay, one moment, please. Okay, give me one moment. In the meantime, you can, of course, download the Poll Everywhere application on your cell phones to participate in this in this poll or in the survey. Okay, here we go. Okay, let me share one more time. This time uh, the whole screen, all right. And okay, and I'm gonna share now, okay. So the first question, wow, okay, you're already answering that. The first question is, 
compared with the other language skills, listening is a passive activity. And here, I'm not sure if it's only one person or maybe a lot of people participating in the poll everywhere uh, say that they strongly agree with this, okay? Um, yes, there's a belief that reading and listening are passive skills or passive activities. But it's been found in research that uh, actually they're very, very active. They're interactive uh, activities or skills to develop in class. Okay, so that is something probably we need to um, re read some some books on on uh, what it means to teach listening, but of course with a new perspective, the perspective of teaching it for um, for interaction, basically. Okay, so. They only have one answer maybe, or maybe a lot of people strongly agreeing with this, all right? So let's move on to the next one. Okay, the second one is the most important thing in listening instruction is that students get the right answer. What are your beliefs about that? Your own experience regarding this statement. The most important thing in listening instruction is that students get the right answer. Well, here uh, people participating in the in the poll everywhere say that they strongly disagree with this. Of course, it's one probably single activity among many others that we can do when we teach listening. Okay, get the right answer might not be always what we need to do in, in a listening lesson, by the way. Okay, so I think that is something we need to think about too. Well, uh, some people here slightly disagree with this uh, statement. That will depend, of course, on, that will depend on our own experience, maybe not only on our experience in teaching or as teachers, but also as students. Maybe as students, our teachers just played the recording for us to listen and then, of course, complete some uh, fill, in the fill in the gap exercises or um, answer some comprehension questions. Okay, so that is something we need to, of course, look at as well. All right, so a lot, of, a lot more people participate in this time. They're, of course, uh, strongly disagree, agree, partly agree, and slightly disagree that um, we have the results here. Okay, interesting, interesting. We have divided opinions about this. That's actually the nicest part of these uh, webinars because we can meet people with different experiences, different, uh, uh, different uh, let's say, uh, backgrounds and all that. So we can always, of course, exchange ideas in order to uh, do our jobs better in the classroom. Okay, the next one is captions and subtitles are useful. What do you think about that? Captions and subtitles are useful, right? Part, people partly agree with that, agree with that as well. Some people agree with that. Some more agree with that in fact now. Okay, captions and subtitles are useful, okay. So if, if you're teaching, basically, you know, we always talk about um, scaffolding, you know, and there are way, the different ways we can scaffold in class. When teaching listening, maybe one way we can scaffold is by, of course, providing, for example, the context of what we're going to play, the recording we're going to play, or by providing the caption or the subtitle of whatever we are uh, actually playing. Now, nowadays, in fact, when you buy a textbook for your, for your school, the textbook comes with the scripts at the back of the book. So uh, with those scripts, you can always um, do some different activities to improve listening skills, okay? So that is something we probably should also take into account. So a lot of people agree with this uh, statement now, number three. Next, um, learner anxiety is a major obstacle in L2 listening. I think last week, uh, Leonardo Mercado referred to um, this, this, this important uh, aspect, and it is something we need to, of course, take into account. Learner anxiety is a major obstacle in L2 listening. Well, then our, uh, our job is, or the next question is, what can we do to um, maybe lower the anxiety in the classroom then? Okay, so the effective filter is something we need to take into account when it comes to teaching, well, not only listening, but also some other skills. The thing is, what do we uh, favor more? Okay, what do we what, what what do we want to achieve in a particular activity? And if there's something like, for example, the effective filter affecting you know uh, achieving that objective, of course we have to do something about it. Okay, so 
Number four, yeah, a lot of people say strongly agree with this statement. That, of course, is one of one of the obstacles for achieving uh, the objectives in terms of L2 listening. Okay, great, great there. Now let's move on. Number five, it says here, listening means understanding words. So teachers just need to help learners understand all the words in the sound stream. Here, some people agree with that, which means that uh, it is important and maybe even necessary to understand every single word to understand the message or to, in this case, to complete, to answer the questions. If, if you are, of course, doing some comprehension questions there. Okay, so now some people disagree with that, strongly agree. Okay. So sometimes understanding every single word in a sound stream might not be so necessary because maybe what you want is the message. What is the message? What is the main idea? What is the gist of that particular, um, I don't know, uh, piece of information that you want to get there, okay? So that is something we also need to look at. Very interesting. What about the live chat? What are people saying in the live chat here? Mm -hmm. All right, people also, you can, you can participate, but you can put, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, just to, to have a record of your answers in the live chat. If you were not able to join Poll Everywhere, or if you're not doing the um, Google Forms. Okay, great. Now let's move. Um, teaching listening through video is better than audio alone. All right, probably agree here, right quickly, okay. Teaching listening through video is better than audio alone. Of course, the demand, we should consider the demand, right? If it's audio alone, there's more demand than when probably scaffolding. And maybe in some cases we do need to scaffold because it's necessary to do that. If you're, if you're teaching, for example, a group of low basic classes, then of course you wanna scaffold and you wanna provide some hints, some help so that they can succeed. In any case, the idea is that our students should succeed at whatever task activity we do in class, okay? So uh, here people agree, strongly agree. Well, again, we have divided opinions about this. Maybe some people don't like using videos in class for doing listening activities. Some others may do it. It all depends on uh, what we wanna do, of course. Maybe in one, sec in one moment of the class, we can play the audio alone. And then we can play the video with some captions. And the, and the second time we play uh, the, the same sound or the same, um, the same let's say, audio. So uh, there are different ways we can use, of course, the video. Okay. Uh, all right. Interesting ideas again there or responses. Okay. Seven. Learners um, with good listening ability in their first language will also become good L2 listeners. What do you think about that? What are your beliefs, assumptions, experiences with that? Students or learners with good listening ability in their first language will also become good L2 listeners. Here, people say strongly agree, agree. Yeah, everything depends on uh, maybe our own uh, approach or perspective on teaching in general, right? Those who, those people who are who are who call themselves constructivists will say, all right, what is that thing that the student brings to class? Isn't it the L1? Isn't it in this case maybe Spanish? How can I use that L1 so that I can build up on that knowledge that he already has that he or she brings to class so that I can in this case teach him or her English, new sounds, new structures, for example new uh, vocabulary, etc. You can take advantage, for example, of the cognates that are, you know, words with a similar spelling and of course also meaning in both the L1 and the L2, okay? So, okay, again, we have uh, kind of divided ideas. People slightly disagree. Others uh, partly agree, agree. Of course, more people in this case agree with this, uh, with this idea, okay? So again, let's take into account that students don't come to class, let's say, in blank. They come to class with something. They bring to class experience. They bring to class some knowledge, okay? Especially if you're teaching in the high school on the secondary level, they are doing, they're, 
they are learning many things in different subjects. So you can use that knowledge and build up on their L1, in this case, to teach them the L2, okay? A lot of people participating in the live chat too. Thank you very much. Ellie Santos, Ernestina Pacheco. I've heard that name before, okay? So I think she's very popular. Olga, Miss Juanita, Madeleine, Miguel, Rosa. And thank you everybody for participating in the live chat. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth, and everybody who's really you know, eager to share their beliefs. Remember, this is not good or bad. We're just going over our own experiences and beliefs about teaching listening in class. And we might have maybe a wrong conception about some things, so or we're here to help each other. This is supposed to be a community, all right? Eight, when teachers provide learners with the context for a listening activity, they give away too much information. What are your beliefs about that? When teachers provide learners with a context for a listening activity, they give away too much information. Here people disagree. Some people partly agree with that. Okay. I don't know, how does it feel when you just uh, tell your student, you know, please everybody listen up now. I'm gonna play the recording. You're gonna listen to the recording. It's uh, two minutes long. And then here you have three questions for you to answer, okay? Without any context at all, all right? Probably it's better to give him some context anyways. Like uh, I'm gonna play a recording. There are two speakers. One of them is a 15 year old girl and the other is a man, is a 50 year old man, okay? So that they can, you know, be in a way more interested and try to find out the relationship between the speakers and the in the recording or in the video if you're playing a video, okay? So given the context actually is essential when, when doing listening activities in class. Okay, the, what about the live chat? Yeah, a lot of people giving their answer. They say B, I guess, E, okay. Maria Esther Chavez, Pilar Quispe. All right, Noelia Butrón, Jacqueline Solano. Giovanna Benitez, a, a lot of people participating. I love, I love the, you know, the active participation in the live chat. Thank you very much again. Okay, let's move on. Uh, number nine, interactive listening, conversation with another, another speaker is more difficult than one-way listening, radio or television. Disagree, agree. What do you think about that? What about the live chat? Okay, interactive listening, conversation with another speaker is more difficult than one way listening. It might be more difficult if we do not provide the right instruction, maybe the right instructions, the right, um, I don't know, scaffolding, for example. Okay. So uh, it all depends on how we, um, we carry out the lesson in this case. Okay. So we have here, different different um, experiences, different uh, assumptions about interactive listening. They say, you know, it is something we should aim at, in fact, in the classroom, because it all depends on um, what we want. We want students to, you know, do really good at English for class use, or so that they can eventually use that knowledge outside the classroom. I think the latter is, the actual objective or is a competence we should be developing in class, okay? So that they can eventually, we're not of course saying that they'll become B2 or B C1 users of the language overnight, but uh, you know, uh, especially in, in the, in the, uh, in the secondary level in our country, uh, I think uh, they have uh, a lot of time to, to do that, okay? To, I mean, to, to reach a good level of English, of course. Everything in this case, of course, that goes along with the standards, with the uh, competences and everything in the in the curriculum. Okay, yeah, interesting, interesting here. People agree and again, disagree as well. All right. Again, we're not um, judging people. We're not saying you're doing wrong, you're doing correct, but we're saying, you know, let's reflect. Let's reflect on our experiences in teaching L2 listening. The last one, letting students listen on their own according to their interests is the best way to develop 
listening skills. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there are two types of listening in general, listening, listening, let's say, approaches, let's say. Um, the first one is intensive listening, the kind of listening we do in class, right? We prepare the lesson, we look for resources, we do the, the activity in class, we, of course, assess uh, what we did in class, but also we have extensive listening, okay, that, they, that can be done kind of at the more relaxed way out of class, uh, a, a type of listening in which students can have a choice to uh, choose, have a chance actually to choose. Their, uh, what they want to listen to, for example. Same, same goes for reading. You know, there's intensive reading and also extensive reading, okay? I guess um, one of the speakers in the next uh, webinars might, might want to talk about those, those interesting topics, in fact, okay? Here, people say uh, partly agree. Everybody is on the agree part okay letting students listen on their own according to their interests is the best way to develop listening skills so maybe we can um, flip we can do some flip learning okay and since we don't have uh, enough time maybe in class especially if you're teaching at a, a jornada escolar um, I think of some kind I don't remember right now the the actual term but which is only three hours a week compared to jornada escolar completa, which is regular, I get regular, right? Co co complete, which is five hours. Then of course, uh, in those schools, they have more, more time to um, do listening in class, okay? All right, so uh, people in the chat, in the live chat also participating very actively, okay? As you can see, uh, listening here is not, it's not a passive skill, but it's an active skill because you're listening and you're responding very actively in the chat. Okay, let me see here, I have a, I have a message. Give me a second. Okay, let me stop sharing now. Just a moment, please. Oh yes, thank you. Thank you, Mariela. Thanks a lot for, for, that, for that information there. Okay. All right, so... Um, it was interesting to reflect. I hope you felt the same. Uh, and now let's move on to the next part of this. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me stop sharing and share again. Okay. So um, the question, why does listening matter? I think by now it's it's actually clear that listening is something very necessary to develop in class. And today I'm gonna give you some information about how to do it. Am I sharing? Yes, I'm sharing, I'm sharing, yes, yes. Okay, well, first of all, good listening skills are essential for successful learning and L2 acquisition, okay? Good listening skills are essential for successful learning and L2 acquisition. I'm saying that twice because, because of the word essential. It's important for L2 acquisition. Okay, let me tell you a bit more about this now. You know, in a good, let's say, program, we can have different elements, okay? In some programs, uh, maybe listening is kind of skipped or is not, or teachers or students don't pay much attention to it, but I think it's important we, we do. For example, in this, um, in this uh, proposal by Paul Nation and Jonathan uh, Newton, they say that um, these are the learning goals we have to keep in mind when, when uh, developing a, you know, an English language program. We got the general goals and the specific goals. Uh, we got, of course, language items such as pronunciation, vocabulary, grammatical constructions, uh, ideas, for example, the content of what we're gonna teach, the skills is there, you know, as you can see, listening, speaking, reading, and writing skills, and also the sub skills of those of those skills. Accuracy, fluency. Last week you talked about it. What is better? What, what, what we have to do in class? Should we focus more on fluency and accuracy? It's not that we should focus more on one or the other. It's something that we should be doing actually together. You know, as you can see, uh, people need to be accurate 
in pronunciation, but also fluent when they use it, when they perform, uh, when they speak, in this case, uh, right? Strategies as well, right? And text, uh, conversational discourse patterns and rules and text schemata or topic type scales, okay? And regarding uh, the learning goals in the Peruvian national curriculum, is listening in the curriculum? I think it is, let's see. Well, uh, in this case, I'm gonna just refer to one of the competencies, the three for English as a foreign language, but the one of them that specifically talks about listening is competence 13, okay? And as you know, the competence has many capacities. In this case, the first, the, the competence, competence 13 is the student communicates orally, communicates orally in English as a foreign language. To do that first, the student needs to obtain, needs to get information from oral texts. It doesn't say from written texts. So of course the input can be a written text, can be a reading, okay? So that they can, you know, eventually talk, communicate orally. But of course, in this case, since we're in the uh, oral um, communication part, uh, they should be obtaining that information from oral texts. And next, in, well, first, this capacity, obtaining information is a, is a lot, right? It's a low order thinking skill because they have to listen, pay attention and obtain that information. But the next one, inferring and interpreting is a lot, it's a, sorry, it's a hot, high order thinking skill, all right? So by the way, if you want them to infer and interpret, the requisite is that they should obtain the information. So there's no way they can infer or interpret something if they do not first obtain that information from somewhere. In this case, the information, of course, in, in oral form. The next one has to have to do with, with organization, with using the resources, both you know, uh, nonverbal and paralinguistic resources to, uh, to communicate and uh, interacting, of course, speaking and reflecting. The metacognitive uh, part is also, has been considered in, in this competence. So as you can see in the, in the national, Peruvian national curriculum, listening is there. Um, and like the written, the written uh, aspect, you know, reading and writing, each one has its own, its own or their own uh, competences. There's a competence for writing and there's a competence for reading. But for the oral aspect, we only have one competence. If you ask me, I would have liked to have two competences, one for reception, listening, and one for production, speaking. But since we have only one competence, which is competence 13, but that, that also includes listening, com uh, capacity number one, it's there, of course. So we can say that we do care about listening in the Peruvian national curriculum there, okay? All right. Um, yes, here people are saying yes, but sometimes it's hard to develop that skill because there aren't enough devices in some schools. Resources, that's correct. That Kervin Mesa, Kervin Mesa's comment is very uh, accurate, I guess. The experience in some schools might be like that. You have to bring your own speaker to do it. Yes, yes, that, that is that is what happens, I guess, in most, or sorry, in many, in many schools in our country. I'm not just talking about, of course, uh, the situation here in Lima, but of course, situation in the different, uh, in different um, parts of the country um, might be, of course, what in this case, curving is describing. Even in Lima, I guess we also have that, that problem. Okay. Um, now, why does listening matter? Let's keep talking about this. Uh, next, learners or students spend most of their time listening when functioning in a foreign language. Of course, if you're teaching English through English, which is actually one of the best ways uh, to, uh, in this case, acquire the language, um, then of course, they'll be, they'll, they'll be um, exposed to listening all the time. So they'll be listening to you, to the recording, to the speakers in the video, to their classmates in English. So it makes sense that we should be, of course, developing 
the right ways, the right type of lessons or activities in class to do listening. Next, listening is considered the least understood and most overlooked of the four skills. You know, when I first read the National Curriculum Competence 13, or well, I was looking for something that says, that could say, you know, listening, and I didn't find it. But then, of course, at a close reading, I could see that Competence 13, of course, in this case, includes listening, okay? Uh, it seems like uh, the national curriculum kind of overlooks that um, that skill, but it doesn't. It's there. But again, if you ask me, I would like to have uh, maybe um, a listening competence and not just a capacity uh, there. Okay. And next, learners report feeling the least control over listening. That is true. In fact, you know, when you talk, you control. You control the speed of whatever you're going to say. You control your vocabulary. You control the complexity of the grammar that you're going to use when you want to convey something. But when you listen, you cannot control that. You cannot control because the other person, um, you know, speaks the, uh, the way he or she wants, okay? Or at the speed he or she wants. So um, we cannot control that. But we can actually uh, use some strategies such as negotiating meaning or such as asking for clarification. Can you repeat that, please? What was that again? So we can teach those strategies to our students so that they can become, of course, more effective in um, interacting with their, not only their classmates, but of course, eventually with uh, people in real life situations, okay? Um, next. Oh, you can find this information in a very interesting book by Reed that came out actually last year. All right. So um, I think you can order through Amazon. OK, or you can buy you can buy it online as well. All right. But I would recommend this book. I'm going to I'm going to come back to this book in just a moment. OK. Um, oh, by the way, this is Marnie Reed. Uh, and this is an account that you'll find in her book. This is the book. All right, listening in the classroom, teaching students how to listen. All right, I think the title is very, very catchy. And you can tell from that, that here you're gonna learn the way we can, we can teach uh, listening to our students, okay? It's edited by Marnie Reed. This is one of the authors and also Tamara, Tamara Jones. Well, this is an interesting account. It says, I was teaching a cohort of highly verbal, articulate, fluent and polite students who protested with increasing insistence that they could not understand people, including me, because she is a native speaker, outside the classroom. They could readily discuss a wide variety of topics. I mean, they were really good at speaking from the mundane to their professions, their ambitions, their philosophies, and even the meaning of life. How could it be that students could produce so much language, albeit with varying degrees of accuracy, yet insist they could not understand the people they encountered in person, on the radio or television, or even their teachers conversing with each other between classes. When I read this, I, this reminded me of my own experience as a language learner back in 2001, two and three. By then I remember I spent many hours trying to sound natural, of course, because that's what my teachers always advised me and uh, trying to be fluent, okay? To be fluent, you gotta do this and that. So I was working on that. I eventually became fluent enough in, in English. But when it came to talk to uh, native speakers or my own teachers, but you know, not in the classroom, but outside the classroom, I could, you know, hardly follow their conversations. And I wondered, why was that? Until I read this. It seems like it's happening a lot, in fact. People are becoming really fluent in the language. They speak, you know, like parrots sometimes. They just speak, speak, speak. But when it comes to actually interacting, following the conversation in a real life situation, sometimes people have a hard time. And that also happened to me when I was, when I was a student myself. So what about you? Does the account above, this account by Marnie Reed resonate with you in some way? If so, how? Maybe you didn't have that experience. Maybe you, your experience was a little different, 
but uh, this is something we should also pay attention to, okay? And the best way to do that is by, of course, joining this kind of webinars, by sharing our, our own experiences, by reflecting on the experiences that, you know, the 10 statements I showed you at the beginning are really good ones so that we can, you know, um, take our time to think about deeply, to think about those statements and then, you know, mark either agree, disagree or not with those statements, okay? And of course, talk to other colleagues and, and, and discuss, you know, do you agree with this? Why do you do that? So let's discuss and maybe we can find, we can find an answer to the dilemma, to the problem, and eventually find a solution, of course, and, and, uh, and change, right? Change, of course, to do a better job in the classroom, okay? <laughs> Olga Ticona says, totally agree. We must stop talking in Spanish. Yes, yes, that is something I also agree with because, you know, it's becoming very popular, this idea of um, English as a medium of instruction or M M E M E M I. sorry, English as, as a medium of instruction. But of course, we should not disregard also the potential of using L1 in the classroom. I think in one of the webinars last year, for example, Mr. Jesus Nicho and his students talked about the cross-language experiences using, for example, a translanguaging, using uh, some strategies from bilingual education, for example. So, and, and besides, as I mentioned before, we do not uh, start from scratch when teaching English, okay? Even though we're teaching English maybe to first timers, maybe our students come to class and they listen to English for the first time, which is actually kind of strange because with the TikTok, with YouTube, people are kind of more, let's say, um, exposed to English in some way, okay? So, for example, when you, when they want to watch, for example, the uh, the World Cup, you know, the usually there are two hosts and one of them is presenting the event in English, okay? So there are many chances to listen, or maybe not to listen, but to hear at least, at least to hear English, okay? But still, still we need to take into account students experience when it comes to uh, designing the class. Jan here says, with three hours a week, I cannot oblige, oblige my students to speak fluently, understand listening well, okay? That, that is correct. That is correct, Jan. Three hours, maybe uh, it's too little, of course, but the, there are strategies, you know, such as um, flip, flip classroom or flip learning that we can use so that they can, of course, uh, we can do something and not only in class, but out of class as well, okay? So let's move on. Uh, so how do test takers do in the listening section in international exams? I'm gonna present some data that I found on a report, the ECPE 2021 test report. The ECPE, you know, is the examination for the certificate in proficiency in English. It's a C2 level exam. So if you pass this exam, you prove that you can communicate at the highest level in English, okay? So what are the results uh, of this um, report? Let me, let me show you now. I'm gonna show you the section of the exam. There are four sections in the exam and the different levels of, uh, let's say, um, scoring. The first one is honors, the highest level you can get in the exam, pass, low pass, and there are two fails, borderline fail and fail, okay? And these are the numbers or the percentage of test takers in each score band of the four sections of this exam, the ECPE. All right, if we sum up the last two columns, borderline fail and fail, you get this. 33% of people, of test takers, in fact, in this case, test takers, uh, fail the listening section. Compared to reading, 30%. Reading is another skill that we need to work very, very hard, not only in, you know, L2, but also in L1. That is something we are, I think, as teachers aware of. Writing, they do, um, they do better because only 22% fail. And speaking, they do even better because only 11% fail. Okay, and again, as the account uh, account told by Marnie Reed, and I, and also according to my own experience, speaking is something we can achieve probably quite fast, especially of course if we devote enough time to 
studying the language to getting ourselves maybe exposed to the language in different ways. Of course, we can achieve a high proficiency in speaking in oral language quite fast. But again, listening seems to be the problem here, okay? So that's why the title of this presentation is problems, you know, challenges, but also solutions. I'm, I'm gonna provide some solutions. Of course, uh, they are not the only ones, all right? They are not the only ones. And I hope you can also share what you're doing at your schools so that we can, you know, build uh, a community in which everybody uh, can share something so that, you know, we can, we can um, maybe change this situation, maybe, we can take 33% down to 30 or 28% when it comes to listening in exams, for example. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, now let me show you here the evolution of approaches to L2 listening instruction. The re reflection statements I showed you before, the 10 statements, um, you know, are also reflect our own beliefs in terms of L2 L2 uh, listening instruction, okay? And that depends, of course, maybe on or, or, or on our own experience. Maybe we're teaching English the way we were taught 20, 30, or 40 years ago, and we haven't changed our own approaches over the years. Although in the last uh, couple, of, couple of decades, there's been a lot of research, but still we, may, we might not be using, we, we might not be turning that research result into pedagogy or into pedagogical practices, okay, to, in this case, improve listening instruction. All right, okay. The first approach, I'm talking about, of course, in general terms, the first approach to listening is listen to repeat. This was very popular back in the 1950s, 60s, when the, um, when the audiolingual approach or method was very popular, you know, the, the teacher, could play a recording or, you know, maybe he, he or she said something and students repeat it after him or after her, okay? Maybe uh, in some schools we're still doing this. This is kind of an outdated approach. We might consider, you know, taking into account other approaches here. The next approach is the question answer uh, comprehension approach an approach in which um, the teacher plays a recording and then students listen to the recording and they then answer some comprehension questions, which is what uh, students end up doing in um, the listening section of most, of all, in, in fact, I would say international exams, okay? So, and the last one, is maybe what we should aim at, uh, real life listening in real time. What does that mean? Well, if we say that we are teaching English and that we are using the communicative language teaching, the CLT, maybe this is what we should be doing. Real life listening in real time. Um, maybe with the tasks, with the um, projects we develop in class, of course they, should you know use English when working on the tasks and doing the, the projects, then of course we're promoting real life listening in real time. Okay. And um, this is something we should be doing probably, but we some of us might be maybe in the first approach, in the listening to repeat approach, or in the second or in the third. In any case, the idea again here today is to reflect. Okay. So I hope you have enough time to reflect and, and share, of course, share your beliefs and, and, and then of course, hopefully change, change for, um, so that you can, you know, do, do lesson, listening lessons that benefit your students the most, okay? Now, what is the problem with instructed L2 listening today? Let's see, what is the problem with instructed listening, L2 listening today? Uh, Reed, again, Reed says, in instructed settings, listening is unidirectional. This, this is what has been found in most listening lessons. That is, a teacher plays a recording and the students listen to that and then they answer some questions, some comprehension questions. They complete some, some answers. They complete some sentences, sorry. They maybe choose uh, true and false, etc. Okay, that's basically 
unidirectional. Um, instructional focus is misplaced on the product of comprehension rather than its process. Actually, this is uh, something good, I would say, to um, focus on the, on the product, because in real life, what we are concerned about is the product, okay? Because when you listen to some, somebody or someone, you are interested in the information that he or she has to provide. With that information, you will eventually make decisions. And then is when that information turns into knowledge, okay? So, um, but that happens in real life. We should be doing maybe something else in the classroom. We should be focusing on the process. I'm not saying that we shouldn't focus on the product. I'm saying that, or in this case, Mendelssohn, Mendelssohn says, we should focus on the, process, on the process and also on the product. Um, when teaching listening, there seems to be no corresponding recognized need to teach the requisite listening skill, which is processing oral input. When we teach, for example, uh, reading, first students need to decode uh, the words, the letters, the um, you know the punctuations, etc. So we're teaching the requisite for that for the written input in this case. But when it comes to listening, it seems like we're not paying attention to the requisite skill, which is processing oral input. And, and also the influence of instructional materials and curriculum guidelines developed specifically for reading pedagogy is applied to listening instruction. It means that we have been borrowing the, um, the, the materials and the guidelines that were developed for teaching reading to teach listening, okay? So maybe it's something we have to think about and of course change and implement in our classes, okay? Um, then it says here, um, again, Mendelssohn, it says, uh, much of what is traditionally misnamed teaching listening should in fact be called testing listening, okay? Because it seems like in the classroom, we're basically testing, testing listening. We're not teaching listening. We're not teaching people to become better listeners. You know, uh, when we teach reading, we should also focus on helping them become better readers, better writers, better speakers, right? When it comes to listening, it should be the same. We should teach or we should help our students to become better listeners. How do we do that? I'll show you some ideas in just a moment. Okay. So again, um, it says here that we should go from not only you know, what has been found is that a lot of listening lessons focus maybe exclusively or too much on the product. That is, they what, we, what they do in classes, listening to learn, which is, again, what we do in real life. We listen to someone to learn, to gain information. With that information, we make decisions. So that information turns into knowledge when we make decisions, okay? But in classroom, we should not only be doing that, we should also move to the process. We should help students to learn to listen, okay? They should be, I mean, our students should be learning to listen, to listen better, of course. So again, Vandergrift here says, listening instruction is expanding, fortunately, from the focus on the product of listening to include, to include a focus on the process, okay? That is something we should be, of course, doing in class too. How do we do that? Maybe might be your next question. All right, let me show you here some ideas. Okay, so approaches to L2 listening instruction. First, we can raise metacognitive awareness. When we do that, we're favoring top-down processes. In other words, we're favoring the fact that students pay attention to the message, to the meaning of whatever text, oral text we are either playing in class or we, may, we might be actually saying that ourselves, in fact, okay? But raising metacognitive awareness is one way to, to do listening in class. The second way is to develop lexical segmentation and word recognition skills, which favors bottom-up processes. Bottom-up processes have to do with paying attention to the um, individual elements of the language, you know, the sounds, the words, the sentences, 
and so on, okay? So if we pay attention to the words, to the individual words, students in this case, we're helping students to listen, to listen better in class, okay? All right, again, Van der Grift says, given the critical role of listening in language learning, students need to learn to listen, all right? So in class, students should learn to listen so that they can better listen to learn, okay? So first, in class, so when we prepare a lesson, a listening lesson, we should keep into, in mind this. What am I doing to help my students to learn to listen? So that they eventually, maybe in the classroom, but most likely out of the classroom, okay? They can become better listeners. They can be better at listening to learn, okay? Isn't that interesting? All right, I hope you find it interesting, okay. Well, um, let me show you now the problems or challenges in L2 listening and how to deal with those problems. Okay, here comes what I mentioned before, the approaches combined with, you know, um, the challenges, the problems, and also how to solve, how to deal with those, with those challenges. Okay, this is the first one. The first challenge is this. The people um, have problems at recognizing known words in connected speech, okay? And how do we raise metacognitive awareness in this case? We can pass a survey. If you're teaching maybe first timers or if you're teaching a low basic class, you can do this in, in the student's first language, okay, in, in L1 or in Spanish. If everybody speaks Spanish in your class, of course, you can you can do the survey in Spanish if they know no English at all, right? Go ahead and you can do the survey in survey or this poll in Spanish. First question you can ask or you can put is this. Native speakers speak too fast. If they didn't speak so fast, I could understand them. Okay, so first we need to find out what our students' assumptions about the language are. They might think this, they might think the native speakers speak too fast. And if they, if native speakers didn't speak so fast, I could, or they could understand them better. Okay. The second question or the second assumption that you wanna find out is when listening, I pay attention to the content words. The little words, the function words aren't important. Okay. So maybe the problem to actually, um, getting the message to understanding the meaning or the message of something when they listen to someone or something is that they don't pay attention to the little words because the little words might actually change the meaning of whatever uh, has been conveyed. Okay, so I guess everybody is kind of familiar with a close exercise. A close exercise is a short text in which some uh, words have been removed and the challenge for students is, of course, to you know fill in those blanks in terms of both grammar and meaning. Okay, those two elements. But in this case, um, I've removed even two words in in some in some cases. In others, just one. Okay. So uh, what you can do, of course, is um, get a listening, a, a recording. Okay, a transcript. Then use a portion or a part of that transcript and prepare your handout by removing, by you know, creating a close activity in which you have to remove the little words, those words that cause problems in connected speech, okay? And um, play the recording, have students listen, and then they complete here the, the function words, okay? Because students might have a problem at recognizing known words, words such as a, uh, an, the, their, you, etc. the function words, okay, in connected speech. For example, for number one, uh, learning a foreign language at an, at an adult age. Maybe they, they don't understand orang, but they understand at and, but actually people will not speak that way. People will not say learning a foreign language at an adult age might become people 
usually will say learning a foreign language at an adult age might become a become a become a nightmare if you do not devise certain strategies etc okay so the first challenge that we should be aware of and of course plan a lesson in class so that they can become better listeners is that they should be able to recognize known words in connected speech so you can do that by first finding out their assumptions about connected speech and in this case the little words the function words and then maybe creating a close activity in which you you remove the function words the words that people pronounce in some way differently okay usually connected you know and uh then do the activity in class all right for example in the next in the next minutes i'll i'll suggest the best ones so you can so you can successfully learn any new language okay so um this is an activity that can help you in class as you can see um, it can be any anything. Of course, it depends on the topic of your lesson. You can find a a video, maybe you can get the the, the transcript, a short one. Okay, in, in those ones, of course, uh, the speaker should be focusing on the little words or the function words. Okay. Next, um, the second challenge. The second challenge is in L two listening and sorry, understanding a speaker's intended meaning. Here, um, a lot of people have problems with this. Even I had problems with that. I would say actually sometimes I have problems with that even now because uh, sometimes I, I kind of are more paying attention to the, um, maybe to, 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 to the grammar, something like that, and then and, and forget about the actual intended meaning, okay? So um, again, we can, we can uh, first find out our students' assumptions. We can pass a, a survey, a two-question survey, a short one. Again, if you're teaching low basic classes or every, if everybody has, a, let's say, is, is, is their first time in an English class, then of course you can, you can pass a survey in the student's L1, okay? The first one is if I can understand all the words in a sentence, I can understand the meaning of the sentence. So it seems like some people need to understand all the words or, or every single word to understand the meaning of whatever he or she is trying to convey. Second, English intonation is merely decorative. It cannot be, it cannot change the meaning of a sentence. Okay, again, students might think this is true and we need to find out and do something about it. If this is what they think and if the challenge they have is that have a, they have a problem understanding a speaker's intended meaning, this is what you can do. Again, something very simple, okay? You can play a sound file, you can record yourself, you know, and then play the recording in, in class, okay? As one of you said in the live chat in a moment, you can bring, you can take your own, your own speaker to the class if the school does not provide any, all right, so maybe that, that is something you can do as well. But the sound file can, can be something like this, okay? The teacher didn't record the attendance. The teacher didn't record the attendance. And then your question can be, has the, has the attendance been recorded yet? Has the attendance been recorded yet? Okay. Of course, the sound file is just a sound. You are not showing, you know, the, the actual words. The question can be on a can be on a on a handout, and they have to explain. They have to explain the answer. Okay, they have to answer and explain, of course. And the answer to this um, sentence, the teacher didn't record the attendance is to the question. Sorry, to the question: Has the teacher has the attendance been recorded yet? Well, yes, the principal did it. Okay. Sometimes uh, students might be paying more attention to the negative. The, the teacher didn't record the attendance and they might say, well, he did not or, or he or she didn't. Okay. So uh, again, again, in this case, uh, the challenge is understanding a speaker's intended meaning, what the speaker really meant when he or she said something. In this case, the teacher didn't record the attendance 
means that the teacher didn't do it, of course. Someone else did, someone else did record the attendance. Okay, so again, it's something very simple. You can prepare a handout. You can use different, of course, don't expect students to understand uh, speaker's intended meaning overnight. One class, it'll be enough. I think you can plan this for maybe for, um, for a semester or something so you can see the results later on. The idea is to develop listening skills and that is not something we can do in one or two classes, by the way, okay? So you can find many exercises, you can prepare many handouts as well to, uh, to do this, okay? Um, now, someone mentioned something about uh, resources in class, that we don't have resources in class and sometimes maybe if you're teaching at a school in which you don't have a textbook, Usually, you know, textbooks come with uh, with the with the CD or with the MP3 with recordings in MP3 format that you can download and play it for students to listen and do the listening activities. Okay, but if your school does not provide any of that resource, actually, if the school does not have any textbook at all, of course, teachers have to create it, have to create uh, materials. Okay, so. Um, Let's let's talk about that that problem that that all of us face. All right. So overcoming lack of resources. The first way, I believe, the first way to overcome a lack of resources that maybe you don't have um, you maybe that you're using actually material that had a different purpose. You're using material from YouTube, you're using uh, listening recordings from a different textbook that in a way matches with what you're doing in class but in fact it's um, not that it's not that aligned to the objective of what you want to achieve in class but still you want to use it because it, in a way it helps you know to uh, have a listening lesson in class okay so um, one way to overcome a problem of uh, not having resources is by using this this kind of apps text to speech applications, creating your own scripts and then turning those, you can record actually those your, yourselves or you can turn, you can turn those uh, conversations, those interviews, those um, maybe talks, those lectures into speech, into audio, okay? This application I found when I was preparing this presentation, I haven't used it myself, but it works quite well. It's called Murph.ai, artificial intelligence, by the way, okay? So uh, you can create a conversation, a dialogue, you can create a, an, an interview, or maybe just a, a lecture, and this will turn that text into speech, into, into an audio recording. Uh, and you can choose, in this case, you can choose uh, the, if you want a female speaker, a male speaker, you know, that can also help to have actually different roles in this audio material, okay? And then once you're finished, of course, what you do is you basically download. You download a video, you download voice only, you can download in MP3 format or any other format that works that works best for you. You can download in different qualities, okay, in stereo, or mono channels. So um, this seems to be a great solution. I haven't used it myself, honestly. I'm gonna start doing that, of course. You know, one of my interests is um, listening. The other one is pronunciation, oral lang oral language, in other words, okay. And uh, since I'm doing my doctor of education. Uh, program at San Marcos, uh, of course, I'm going to research oral language and listening is going to be my focus. Okay, so I'm going to be probably using um, this, this, uh, this resource to um, do my research there. Okay. Well, and that's one way. The other way, if you don't have access to internet, because to, to, to use this, this uh, website, murph.ai, you need internet, okay, you need to pay as well if you want to download, um, you know, more recordings, okay, what you can do is um, be the resource yourself, okay, you can use this technique, 
live listening. In live listening, the teacher gives a lecture about a topic. Maybe you're talking about something specific according to your, to your syllabus in class, and you prepare a short text. You can read it out, or you can just, uh, you know, give the lecture because you know the topic really well for one or two minutes students listen they take some notes and then they and then they of course discuss what they understood okay this is uh alan alan you can find this on youtube but if you have the how to teach english by jeremy harmer you'll find you know that that comes actually with a dvd where you'll find this lesson Alan uses live listening to train students in listening skills in class. And again, as I mentioned before, what the teacher does is he or she um, gives a lecture about a topic, maybe lecture, if the lecture is long, you can have maybe three or four parts. So first you talk about for one minute or one minute and a half or two minutes, maybe the longest. Students listen, they take notes, then they discuss what they understood, or you can pose. Of course, you can pose specific questions for them to for them to uh, discuss. The good thing about this is that they can ask you questions, okay? Because you are giving the lecture, you're you're lecturing, so they can ask you questions. You can they can get instant feedback, maybe if they understood something different, okay? So I would say try live listening if if you feel that you have no resources at all at your school, you're not getting anything, um, any support in terms of resources at school, of course, teachers, you know, have to be uh, resources themselves, okay? Live listening is one solution to overcome the lack of resources, okay? Um, some suggestions here, we're uh, about to finish. Um, first of all, as I mentioned before, we have to know our learners. To expand more on uh, know your learners and some other related topics, you can read, you can read, of course, uh, this the six principles of exemplary teaching published by TESOL, TESOL organization, the TESOL organization. Um, we gotta be aware of the approach to listening we use in class when 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 planning and teaching listening lessons, of course. Move away from testing listening to learning to listen from the product to process. Well, actually include both in this case, right? We're going to implement activities that favor both, you know, top-down and bottom-up processes. A metacognitive awareness approach to L2 listening is what we should aim at. And try different resources to design listening activities, okay? Not only maybe if you have, even if you have a, a textbook provided by your school, maybe it doesn't really, you know, uh, fit your your actual students' needs. You want to talk about, for example, uh, the Candelaria. You want to do something about your region. You wanna you wanna recording a listening activity about, I don't know, um, the carnival in your regions, in your places, and there's no re listening like that in the recordings. Okay. So in that case, of course, we have to change. We have we can use the resources I mentioned before to plan a listening lesson that's more more connected to our students' actual needs, lacks, and wants. Again, join a community of practice to discuss issues related to instructed listening, L2 listening challenges, and look for solutions. And I think this is a great community. English Teachers in Peru is a great community to do that. You can join other communities such as the TESOL organization, the ITEFL organization, and some others in which you can have a place to, you know, um, get your, maybe find answers to your problems, to your challenges, and share your experiences, and of course, maybe help others who have similar problems as well. Okay, so learning community is I would say the best way to uh, overcome problems, of course. Okay, so it's time to um, hear your questions. Uh, just a couple of things uh, before you get started with that. Um, please ask questions relevant on the topic or to the topic. Uh, if the questions are not related to the topic, but it is interesting, I will try my best to answer your questions. And also, I think, um, you know, colleagues in the chat, in the live chat can answer the questions 
if they have the answer, of course, that's something we can do. I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute so that uh, I can hear your questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, dear Cesar, for this amazing presentation. Thank you for sharing your, your knowledge with us. Now we have uh, some questions. We select some questions for you. Please wait for a minute. And I have, we have more than 800 teachers wow. are connected to the session. Yeah, it's really, really wonderful. It's so interesting. Thank you so much again. Now we have the questions for you. Oh, yeah. It's okay. Yeah. So we have some questions for you. Um, this question is from Jacqueline Solano. Jacqueline Solano says, in international exams, the audios are listened to twice. In secondary students, should it also be like this? Yeah, we got to separate, right? I think we got to separate. One thing is a uh, test situation. In a test situation, of course, the exam has its own conditions, right? Uh, in some exams, you can listen just once, or in some other exams, you can listen just maybe twice, okay? But in class, we are instructing, we are teaching, we're helping students to listen better. So, of course, we can play the recording more than once if necessary. And let us remember that we should try our best to scaffold. And we can do that by, of course, uh, providing a context, by uh, maybe turning on the, the subtitles or captions if necessary sometimes. So I would say, go ahead and you know your students better, in fact. So, you know, probably the best answer is depending on the situation. If you have everybody in your class, you know, it has a good level of English, they can follow along your questions, your instructions in English, of course, maybe playing playing the recording once will be enough, if not twice. The third time you can focus maybe on a different aspect of the listening. Maybe you can focus on a specific um, skill, a sub skill of the listening. So you can play a third time, of course, with a different activity maybe, okay? So, you know, um, for example, in a listening lesson, I've seen that uh, the same recording is played even five times because there are like five exercises. For the first exercise, usually is, you know, to find out students' background knowledge, but the second, the third, and fourth exercise, uh, you gotta play the audio sometimes twice, even three times because it is necessary. In class, we are helping students to become better listeners. So I think we gotta be, of course, flexible with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I totally agree with your answer. <laughs> and right. I have a mixed question here. Okay. Okay. This is from Elva Orcasitas and, and Maria Roman. Elva Orcasitas says, what can we do in public schools with two or three hours uh, uh, a week and 30 students to improve the listening skills? Maybe, Maria Roman says, <laughs> uh, you can share ideas, please for uh, well, teaching listening skills to public students. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I began uh, my career at a public school. I taught at a public school for two years. And um, yeah, of course, uh, teaching English for three hours a week is not enough to develop the different skills of the language or to cover the three competences in this case and all the capacities in each competence it's not enough. So um, my piece of advice would be to try, um, for example, I don't know, flip learning, uh, because we need to do something else out of class, not just assign homework. Maybe we can give, give them something for students so that they can prepare before coming to class, and we can build up on what they research, what they read, what they listened in class. In, before out of class, sorry, and in class, we can, of course, do some connected activities, okay? Another way could be by promoting uh, extensive listening is something that's very, very um, helpful because, you know, uh, people, I think, are more, I would say, um, interested in something that they like. 
sometimes what we uh, play in class, I'm talking about the recordings, what we play in class is not interesting, and that's why they end up maybe uh, not answering all the questions or not completing the activities, not because they don't know, but because the resource or the material is not interesting because it has nothing to do with him or her. Maybe in the recording, there's a person talking about a situation somewhere in, you know, in some other place, and there's not, it has nothing to do with the, actu the student's actual life or experience. So that's why I was saying, maybe turning uh, text into speech by using some applications like the ones I showed today, for example, can help. You can maybe create a short text about um, your own habits or about your own um, culture or traditions and um, you know turn that into a listening activity by using applications such as morph.ai and um, play that because now maybe uh, it's something about this, that the student knows that's more connected to the student's own experience and they will pay more attention to that, okay? Of course, in class, we should be doing a mix of different things as well. We should play the recording that's been prepared by experts, but also I think teachers, teachers should become uh, materials writers. We should be aiming at that. And I think in this community, we can probably have a have a group of teachers, you know, basically not just sharing, but preparing material, improving material in, in, a, in a way that it not only is, you know, I know that there are people who just kind of are consumers of materials, but we need to be prosumers. We need to produce materials and of course also share and consume materials, okay? Yeah, thank you, thank you. We have lots of resources in Aprendo en in Casa. Yes. So, for example, Aprendo Casa has created some audios according to our context, and maybe we can use them. Now, and I have the last question for you, dear Cesar from Luz Adriana Jaramillo Villegas. Uh, she says, I have a question. What is the best way to teach listening skills to small children from preschool students? Yeah, honestly, I have not explored uh, teaching listening to younger learners myself that much. Um, I, I, I cannot say there's uh, probably the best way, but uh, there are interesting books. Probably um, I can suggest one by Lyle Cameron, I think. Lyle Cameron has a very interesting book on teaching young learners. Also, there are many, many in the field, but honestly, uh, my, my experience is basically with teenagers and adults. Of course, in any case, I would say the idea is to uh, help them to listen, to, to learn to listen. They should learn how to listen English and use their um, background knowledge, their previous knowledge, the knowledge they have in the L1 and build up on that knowledge. I would say that, okay. Thank you so much, dear Cesar. Please stay with us some minutes more. Mm -hmm. Now I have a um, surprise for you teachers. Tenemos aquí una sorpresa. Quiero agradecerle de todo corazón a César Pablo por haber aceptado la invitación el día de hoy. Vamos a dar algunas instrucciones que deben eh, eh, ser muy, muy claras y muy bien entendidas para poder llevar a cabo el siguiente sorteo de becas. Eh, César ha tenido la generosidad, la amabilidad de poder otorgar una beca completa y una media beca para el curso de preparación que está desarrollando, el cual vamos a querer, estimado César, que puedas compartir con la comunidad, porque sabemos que hay muchos, muchos teachers que están súper interesados y que tienen como objetivo el poder lograr una certificación internacional eh, para poder avalar el nivel de inglés que tienen. Antes de continuar contigo, César, dame un minutito que vamos a ir eh, dando el éxito Vamos a compartir en este momento el link para registrar la asistencia y antes de ello, teachers, por favor, súper atentos para que no haya ninguna confusión, ¿sí? Antes de ello, eh, les doy la keyword de hoy día que lo van a encontrar también en el exit ticket, ¿ok? Para que la puedan completar, es sharing. Recuerden, keyword in today's session is sharing, ¿ok? 
va a estar dentro de las preguntas y ahora sí le doy el pase a mi estimado Court Vilela para que pueda compartir el ticket con todos los teachers. Court. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. And thank you, Cesar Pablo, for such an outstanding webinar. You're welcome, Kurt. So here's the exit ticket. Please pay attention. I'm going to spell it in Spanish. H-T-T-P-S, dos puntos, dos slashes. Luego viene la C minúscula, la U, la T. Otra T, punto, L, Y, un slash más y el nombre, ¿no? De nuestra comunidad. La E mayúscula, la T mayúscula, la I minúscula, la P mayúscula, seguimos con mayúsculas nada más, S, U, M, M, E, R, Dos, y acabamos con minúsculas ND, our second ETIP Summer Webinar. Atentos, entonces, que ya Mary nos dio la palabra clave que es sharing. Seguro está en el exit ticket. Y a cruzar los deditos para poder ganar lo que a continuación nos va a presentar Mariela. Muchísimas gracias, querido Kurt. Espero que el día de hoy sí le des la, la suerte a un teacher varón que se han estado quejando en la última sesión de los webinars porque no les tocó la beca. Recuerden que no se pueden desconectar. Están llenando el exit ticket y con toda esa data en unos minutitos más, ya tenemos, ya pasaron cinco o diez minutos más, cerramos el registro de asistencia y vamos a continuar con el sorteo. Y ahora sí, Estimado César, pido por favor tu atención para que nos puedas ayudar aquí. No antes, 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 terminamos con esto. Dame un segundito. Querida Zulamita, ¿te encuentras por ahí, por favor? Zuli. Felicita Bella, nos comparte la invitación para la próxima semana que tenemos el sábado, Zuli. Of course. Thank you, Miss Mary. Hello, dear teachers. Uh, well, I'd like to invite you to enjoy another interesting webinar the next week on Saturday 25th at 6 p.m. It will be presented by Karen Mesa. Uh, the topic is really interesting, enhancing the writing skills. As teachers, we know that uh, writing is so important because it allows our students to communicate ideas or opinions and express feelings and teachers uh, play a vital role um, in developing this skill in our students. So uh, you can't miss it out the next Saturday 25th at 6 p.m. Don't forget teachers, see you there. Thank you. Thank you so much dear Suli. Ya saben que tenemos una cita el próximo sábado. Vamos a abarcar el skill de writing con nuestra estimada Karen Mesa, quien ha estado mucho tiempo a cargo del Ministerio de Educación como especialista del área de inglés. Así que ahora continuamos. Ahora sí, por favor, estimado César. Coméntanos, compártenos, por favor, un poquito de esta propuesta de capacitación, de esta preparación, que yo sé que muchos teachers van a estar súper interesados en ello. Okay, okay, thank you. I'm gonna share one more time, please. I'm gonna okay. share my screen, okay. All right. Well, um, um, you know, this is the, um, the, the, the C2 level in the Council of Europe, the, you know, the CEFR, the Common European Framework, states that a person at a C2 level can do this can understand with ease virtually everything heard or read. So listening is there one more time, okay? So a person at a C2 level can understand with ease virtually everything heard or heard or read. 
can summarize information from different spoken and written sources, reconstructing arguments and accounts in a coherent presentation, can express themselves spontaneously, very fluently and precisely, differentiating finer shades of meaning, even in more complex situations. Okay, so uh, I got a question for you. It says, do you want to kill two birds with one stone? I mean, do you want to prepare for an international exam, but also improve your English? Maybe your English is at a, at a B2 level, but you want to take it to a higher level, okay? Because as language teachers, in this case, as English language teachers, of course, we have to develop our, our English proficiency more and more. Okay, so um, that's why I prepared this this program. It's a three course or three month program to prepare for the ECPE. We were not only you will receive, uh, let's say, um, information about the format of the exam and practice exams, but also develop your English. We'll revisit vocabulary, grammar, of course, develop listening skills develop uh, reading, writing, speaking, all the skills, okay? At a C1 to reach the C2 level, okay? So that's why, again, if you have a B2 level right now, and maybe you want to go a little higher, but you don't find a place where to prepare for, for that, uh, you can, of course, consider preparing for this exam. Maybe you don't want to take this exam. Maybe you want to prepare for another for the Cambridge exams. You can just, of course, do that as well in some other places. I know good good places for where you can do that as well. Okay, but the one I prepared is specifically for the examination for the certi of the certificate of proficiency in English, the ECPE for from the University of Michigan. Okay, and um, for now, basically the classes are in the mornings. 7 to 8.30, okay? And we have live lessons, of course, because the best way to improve uh, English is by participating in live discussions, you know, doing exercises, sharing with classmates, with the teacher and everything. So this is what I have for now, for now, okay? And then also you have the self-paced tasks where you will review, reinforce and expand grammar and vocabulary, of course, at a high level. Okay, in this case, um, the program is only for for people who want to take their English to a high, high level. Okay, so uh, that's, but also uh, what I wanted to, to say is before you get disconnected, I wanted to, um, to, to, to ask you a couple of things, right? And if you have had any aha moments during the presentation, I hope you had. I hope you have found uh, anything interesting. Uh, during the presentation, if so, uh, will you put, you know, that in, that new information? Will you turn that information into knowledge by putting that into practice? How? Okay. So, I would like you to reflect before you get disconnected. And one more question is: Do you still have a, a hmm, like a doubt? So, do you still have a hmm? What will you do to fill in the gap? Are you going to join a community of practice, maybe? Are you going to read more books, read maybe journals, maybe talk to colleagues, maybe create a new community where you will discuss your, your actual problem and then find solutions for the problem in some way? Okay, so I would like you to um, reflect on those two questions before getting disconnected. But I think we have something else, in fact, before getting disconnected. For me, for me so far, this is what I wanted to present and hope you found it interesting. And of course, I'll be more than glad to uh, come back if you uh, wanna invite me for another webinar in the future. Thank you very much. Of course, dear Cesar, <laughs> you, have to, you have to be here again. Um, estimado Cesar, con respeto compartido. Eh, comentarte lo siguiente, seguramente es, eh, lo has escuchado en algún momento, lo has leído acá todos los maestros, los teachers conectados lo saben. Eh, 
En el sector público se han dado muchas becas, te comento, becas incluso para tener algunas capacitaciones en su momento en Estados Unidos, o CETES que han viajado a Arizona, o por ejemplo para eh, la última que hubo para Top Teachers, que fue en el verano del 2020, para poder uh, hacer un curso de inmersión en Guampaní, etc. Pero todo este tipo de becas tienen siempre dentro de los requisitos el que el docente acredite el nivel, ¿no? Con una certificación, ¿no? Una certificación nacional o internacional, ¿no? Nosotros sabemos que las certificaciones internacionales, internacionales pues son bastante valoradas, en, en lo que respecta a, a todo el, el área de inglés en general y entendiendo la propuesta que nos, que nos das, ¿no? Es una preparación, un programa de preparación para este examen, para el ICPI, ¿no? Que tiene, eh, bueno, que tiene como objetivo, entiendo yo, el poder eh, de repente alcanzar el nivel eh, C1 o mayor, y para ello más o menos vendrían a ser maestros que se puedan preparar con el nivel B2, ¿verdad? Y finalizando el programa, pues el docente queda preparado para poder dar este examen internacional. ¿Qué universidad lo acredita? ¿Qué relevancia tiene? Tal vez nos puedes compartir eso. Eh, ya yeah, creo que puedo cambiar a español. Sí, eh, el ICPI es uno de los exámenes eh, más, digamos, reconocidos a nivel, a, a nivel internacional también, porque lo promueve la Universidad de Michigan, por un lado, y eh, el nivel es bastante alto, como mencioné hace un momento, es un nivel C2, por lo tanto, eh, la persona que lo, que lo ostenta o que lo tiene o que lo logra conseguirlo en todo caso, efectivamente está preparado para poder interactuar, como dije hace un momento, pues en diferentes situaciones que le toque vivir, ¿no? Donde pueda utilizar el inglés. La enseñanza es una de ellas, obviamente, como docente sé que está preparado siempre para poder, eh, no solamente, eh, digamos, dictar la clase quizás de acuerdo al sílabo, pero darle algo más, ¿no? Por ejemplo, el ejemplo que puse hace un momento del live listening, lo podría hacer mucho mejor, por un lado, si es que domino el tema, un temita sobre el cual voy a hablar por, unos, por un espacio de tiempo en clase, el estudiante escucha y luego, obviamente, luego discute, responde algunas preguntas, etcétera, ¿no? reflexiona y todo eso. Y con el nivel de inglés que tengo, obviamente, lo puedo hacer mucho mejor todavía en el aula. Con más confianza claro. lo podría hacer, ¿no? Y uh -huh. respecto a lo que quizás se podría mencionar el, el extranjero, igual que los exámenes, Cambridge o las certificaciones Cambridge o claro. TOEFL pues están en un nivel bastante alto, ¿no? Como dije, es un nivel C2. Para el cual, de hecho, si es que uno se prepara para este examen, pero digamos no quiere tomarlo, quiere tomar el Cambridge, también lo puede hacer porque, digamos, lo que importa finalmente es el nivel de inglés que uno quiere lograr. Por eso es dije, por eso puse Ajá. la pregunta, ¿no? ¿Quieres matar dos pájaros de un solo tiro? <risa> bueno, eh, por un lado, prepararte para un examen, pero a la vez, en todo caso, también... Eh, por ahí, si en algunas cosas, digamos, requiero mejorar quizás mi gramática, mi vocabulario, quizás mi speaking, mi listening en todo caso, entonces es un curso el cual te va justamente a ayudar a mejorar esos aspectos. No solamente a decirte el examen es así, eh, tiene tantas preguntas, hay que, puedes tomarlo y ya está, sino también ayudarte en la parte eh, lingüística, la parte comunicativa para que finalmente, pues, digamos, eh, con más confianza, ya sea ECP yeah. inclusive o el CPE uh -huh. o el Cambridge Proficiency, ¿no? Pues lo puedan tomar el TOEFL, si por ahí desean tomar el TOEFL a uh, IBT, por ejemplo, lo puedan hacer, ¿no? Eh, por el momento, como dije hace un momento, solamente estoy ofreciendo esto en las mañanas, de 7 a 8 y 30 de la mañana, y el eh, ganador de la beca, en todo caso, debería acreditar, pues, un nivel B2 por ahí, ¿no? Un nivel B2, digamos que, aunque quizás no lo tenga acreditado, pero siente que tiene el nivel B2 y gana la beca, entonces, bienvenido finalmente, porque estamos, no estamos sin para juzgar, de decir que tienes B2 o no lo tienes y no, lamentablemente, ganaste, pero no te podemos dar la beca, ¿no? Sino que finalmente eh, va a descubrir ahí, inclusive, que su nivel era quizás más de lo que pensaba, ¿no? Y acá con eso lo está consolidando, lo está comprobando finalmente, ¿no? 
Y además lo interesante que me mencionas ahora es que no se trata solo del hecho de que finalmente pues, el objetivo pueda ser el obtener la certificación internacional, sino de que durante la preparación van a poder fortalecer los diferentes skills, ¿no? las diferentes capacidades de, del idioma. ¿no? Y entonces eso es muy, muy importante porque también van a refrescar ahí sus conocimientos. Pero aquí había una preguntita. Antes de que pasemos ya de una vez al sorteo, seguro ya José tiene todo listo. Una pregunta con respecto a la caducidad, aquí han hecho la preguntita, ¿hay caducidad eh, sí, por ejemplo de eh, esta certificación ¿por cuántos años es? Sí, hasta lo que tengo entendido es lo siguiente, ¿no? Por ejemplo, hay certificaciones como el TOEFL que tiene una caducidad de dos años. En dos años eh, hay que volver a tomarlo para, especialmente, si uno, digamos, pues, este, lo toma ahora porque quiere hacer una maestría en Estados Unidos o cualquier otra parte del mundo, en realidad, y finalmente, este, digamos, eh, pasan dos años pero quiere hacer otra maestría, otro estudio, un intercambio, o un trabajo que ya me salió y requiero acreditar mi inglés, si es el TOEFL tengo que tomarlo otra vez, ¿no? Hay certificaciones como las de Cambridge y las de Michigan que no tienen caducidad. Pero okay. en realidad yo aconsejaría en todos los casos siempre, de tiempo en tiempo, ya que vivimos en un es contexto IFL, ¿no? ¿no? En uh -huh. una situación en la cual el inglés no es pues lo cotidiano. Claro. ¿no? Este, yo mismo, ¿no? Como una autoexigencia, medir mi nivel de inglés, cómo estoy cada cierto tiempo. No es como, obviamente, hacer un mantenimiento al auto, ¿no? Este, hay que asegurarnos para que, de que no estemos nos bien, oxidemos, para, que, para no César. oxidarnos, para no accidentarnos en todo caso en el camino. ¿no? Claro. Muchísimas, muchísimas gracias. Entonces, José, eh, si nos das, este, por favor, la voz, si ya estamos listos para continuar con el sorteo. Eh, Mariela, ¿Puedes? inicialmente sí. había, había, había convenido, me parece, una, me, una beca y otra media, pero sí. eh, por ahí este, me parece que podemos manejar en todo caso dos becas completas, ¿no? Para, oh. para toda la comunidad, para las la personas que están acá este, participando activamente oh, y realmente se ha sentido gracias. la, ahí están los la necesidad de prepararse. De, de, de claro esto, que sí, sí, definitivamente. Y bravo, es por bravo, eso bravo. que el mismo... ¿Ya está? Listo. Aquí están... Por favor, a los administradores, encendamos las camaritas, no sean tímidos. Tenemos aquí que animar y dar la buena vibra para todos los teachers que van a participar en el sorteo de estas dos becas. Mil gracias, César. Ahora son dos becas completas, teachers. Acaba de mencionarlo. Así que pasamos entonces al sorteo. Ya pueden visualizar. Como la semana pasada vimos, este es el programa que manejamos para el sorteo. Ahí ya tienen toda la data de que les han llegado, han llenado su registro de asistencia. Y vamos a pasar entonces a la voz de quién. A ver, mi estimado Kurt, tú vas a ser el primero. ¿A quién le vas a dar la suerte? A tu voz. Iniciamos el sorteo. Ok. Three, two, one, go. And stop. Ya tenemos una ganadora, estimado César, ¿puedes leer el nombre, por favor? Sí, Leo, aquí dice Cueva Espinosa, Marcela Liliana. Así es, claps, please, for her. aplausos para ella, y ya sabemos que para que la beca se haga válida, mi estimada Marcela Liliana Cueva Espinosa debe de escribir presente por aquí, por favor. Aquí en el chat le damos solo 10 segunditos para poder reaccionar y escribir presente para que pueda, por favor, hacerse acreedora de la beca. En caso contrario, ya sabemos las reglas. Si no decimos presente, ahí pasamos al siguiente y se va para el agua. Pero seguramente que ya... Ya está por ahí, vamos a esperar un ratito más, a ver, Espinosa, a Cueva, Espinosa, Marcela y Liliana, debe de escribir presente, tipear presente en el chat, o present, Spanish, English, it doesn't mind, pero debe de escribir ahí. Parece que no está. Parece que no, y si no está, bueno, ahorita van a empezar todos porque hay un pequeño lag de, de lo que llega aquí sí, hasta sí. YouTube, entonces ahorita van a empezar todos a pedir que se vaya al agua, al agua para la siguiente. Vamos a ver, ahí está, ya está, no, sin llorar, estimado Kervin Mesa, vamos a ver, ahorita viene la suerte, ahorita viene la suerte, a ver, ¿dónde está? Y creo que no está, pasamos entonces, sí, no está, no está, no está. 
Marcela Liliana Cueva Espinosa, no. Entonces pasamos a la siguiente. Estimada Zuli, a tu voz, por favor. Ok. One, two, three, go. Stop. Estimado César, la ganadora es... Sí, Valeria Dakota Miranda Jurado. Muchísimas gracias y esperamos que esta vez sí esté ahí presente. Valeria Dakota Miranda Jurado. Estimada, hoy, hoy, hoy día va a salir un varón, sí, tiene que salir un varón, estimado Romney. Vamos a ver, por favor... <risa> La vez pasada salieron puras damas, por eso es que están los teachers, se han quedado con la pica de que salga un varón. A ver, Valeria Dakota, Miranda Jurado, escribir por favor en el chat, presente. Eh, a los administradores, por favor, que están en el chat de YouTube, ayúdenos, repitiendo, escribiendo el nombre, por favor. Valeria Dakota, Miranda Jurado, si está por ahí. A ver, vamos a ver, vamos a esperar solamente unos cuantos segundos más, unos 10 segundos más. No está, next, dicen ya los teachers de una vez, y así, hasta que salgan ellos. A ver, Valeria Dakota, sí, ya dijo, porque le... no, no está. Pasamos entonces para la siguiente, vamos a ver, ahora sí. Ahí dijo Dakota. presente. Sí, dijo presente. A ver, a ver, a ver, a ver, a ver, ¿por dónde está? Vale 79. Ahí está, es Dolka Offs. Sí, ¿no? Está como Dolka Offs ahí no, en no, el no. chat. Con Vale no? 79. Ay, 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 ya. Vale 79, presente. Sí, seguros. <ríe> ya. Sí está, al agua, al agua, dicen los demás. <ríe> Qué maldad, Dios mío. ¿Cómo es cuando queremos? <ríe> a ver, vamos a ver. No, sí está. Creo que sí está, por favor. Si es que es ella, una vez más que confirma porque ya no vuelve a escribir. Vale 79. ¿Eres tú? Vale 79, porque sí, sí se apellidaba, creo, ¿verdad? ¿O no? Sí, era Valeria Dakota. Sí, ahí está. Ya, entonces me parece que sí. Muchísimas gracias a los teachers que nos están ayudando. Nos indican que sí, que dijo presente. Uh, igual estamos esperando que escriba. Ha escrito una vez, creo, así que vamos a confiar en ello. Eh, y vamos a otorgarle entonces, ya tenemos la primera ganadora, hacemos la corrección ahí, ahí está, sí, aquí estoy, soy Valeria, bien Valeria, estimada Valeria, felicitaciones, te mandamos aquí un fuerte aplauso, las buenas vibras, y ya tenemos el primer, la primera ganadora, nos vamos a comunicar contigo, no te preocupes, congratulations, y ahora sí, Pasamos al siguiente, a la voz de Mr. Ricardo Núñez. Vamos, un varón, un varón, vamos, Ricky. Sí, pero vamos a ver, para que salga un varón. One, two, three, go. Stop. No, ya no, ya nos van a enjuiciar. La próxima semana tenemos que ver la forma. Vamos a filtrar. <risa> Vamos a filtrar, es una promesa, it's a deal, teachers. <risa> Vamos a filtrar la próxima semana mejor así, ¿ah? ¿eh? Varones, damas. Y tenemos la ganadora es, estimado César. Um, Gloria, Gloria Maribel Solórzano Camones. Gloria Maribel Solórzano Camones is the winner. Y esperemos que esté ahí, y si está ahí, por favor, ya sabe que tiene que escribir presente. Si no escribe presente, entonces no lo vamos a considerar. A ver, nos están escribiendo por el chat, estoy leyendo por aquí. Pasamos por aquí. Gloria Maribel Solórzano Camones, por favor. No, ya los profesores nos están pidiendo next de una vez. Pero no ha pasado ni cinco wow. segundos, teachers. Tengamos un poquito de paciencia. A ver, vamos a ver. Ya, le vamos a dar cinco segunditos más a Gloria Maribel Solórzano. Camones. A ver, vamos a ver. Sí, pues, teacher ben, Benjamín nos dice, we can believe it. Ya, yes, 
No, no es así. A ver, vamos a ver. Water. Ah, agua, ya están pidiendo agua. Agua. <risa> están pidiendo. Ok, ya está. Pasamos a la siguiente. Y ahora sí viene. A ver, vamos a ver. Miss Zulia, usted, usted, usted tiene que darle a ver. Vamos, vamos, con un varón, un varón. Yeah. Vamos, vamos, vamos. One, two, three, go. Yeah. Uy, pero y ahora no sabemos. <risa> Estimado César, and the winner is. <risa> and the winner is Molina Farfán. Y ahora solo él sabe lo que es. <risa> Teacher, ¿qué? A ver, no sabemos, Molina Farfán. Yo creo que pasamos al siguiente porque no está bien registrado no, el nombre. Molina Farfán solamente ha colocado dos apellidos, salvo que esté por ahí, pero no está este, registrado el nombre, ¿verdad? Mm -mm. De repente lo ha, algunos a veces se equivocan y llenan dos, porque en la primera se equivocaron en colocar el correo, en colocar el nombre y luego vuelven a enviarlo. Y de repente ha salido alguno que pues Molina Farfán, pero acá no... Molina Farfán, no sabemos si es, ahorita van a decir los teachers soy yo porque no está el nombre, a ver, Kevin Mesa nos dice no, a ver, Luján, mi casa, Miguel Armando, next, sí, ya, vamos al siguiente, ahora sí, Kurt, tú eres, es, es la voz, ¿no? vamos a ver ahora sí, querido Kurt, vamos. Ya, pero tienen que cruzar sus deditos, pues, si no, no pueden. Por favor, todos. Vamos, Acá, vamos. Parto. Ya, tres, dos, uno, va. A ver, vamos, 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 vamos. Que se chocolate, que se chocolate. Bien chocolate, me está demorando hasta que qué. ¡Uy! Ahí está el varón. Vamos, Carlitos, tú sí estás presente. ¿Quién es el ganador? A ver, el Carlos Orlando Culi Pariachi. Uy, y, ya, y ni digan que no. Y ahora sí que si ya no está, por favor, ya no le echen la culpa a nadie. Kurt, guau, wow, ah, miren, ah, haces magia, haces magia, querido amigo. Y salió un teacher. A ver, vamos a ver que haga quedar bien a los varones, esperemos que diga presente, Carlos Orlando, Cuyi Pariachi, y es conocido, ¿eh? Recu eh, sé que comparte en nuestra comunidad en Facebook, también está en nuestra comunidad en WhatsApp, así que si está en buena hora, y si no va a ser una super pena, Carlos Orlando, Cuyi Pariachi, a ver... Vamos a ver si está por ahí, parece que no, le vamos a dar cinco segunditos más. Yo lo siento mucho, Miss Violeta Molina Farfán ya pasó, la idea es poder confirmar en el momento que realmente están conectados, por eso se les da solo unos segundos para que puedan escribir presente, para poder corroborar que están atentos y conectados y no ha habido la respuesta en su momento. Y mi estimado Carlos Orlando se fue a cenar, así, ya me dijeron todos que se fue a cenar, así que ni modo, no está. Pasamos entonces, Kurt, mira, le habías dado la suerte y ya, ya. Yo creo que César, tú eres el elegido el día de hoy, yo creo que a va ver, a ser así. A ver, a ver, veamos, okay. a tu voz. Go. And stop. Y la ganadora es Eva, Eva Flora, Flora uh -huh. Quispe Luque. Eva Flora Quispe Luque. Eva Flora Quispe Luque, si está presente, por favor, estimada Eva. Eva Flora Quispe Luque. Vamos por ahí. Esperemos que diga, por favor, presente. Tiene que escribir presente en el chat para poder confirmar que está. Recuerden que solamente damos un corto periodo de tiempo para que puedan escribir en el chat. Así nosotros podemos confirmar que realmente están ahí, que están ya, atentos. Ya respondió ¿Sí? ya. ¿Sí? ¿Ya está? Sí. 
excelente. Entonces, felicitaciones. Recordamos aquí a las dos maestras ganadoras de la beca completa otorgada por Mr. César Pablo, a Valeria Dacosta Miranda Jurado, Eva Flora Quispelú, que nos vamos a comunicar con ellas en privado. Y bien, el día de hoy estamos con esto eh, finalizando nuestro webinar y tenemos aquí ya para cerrar la noche agradecerles a todos los maestros que se han quedado todos los maestros que se han quedado el día de hoy miles miles de gracias por seguirnos eh, nos despedimos mostrándoles aquí el grandioso equipo de administradores de nuestra comunidad de English Teachers in Perú somos alrededor de 20 docentes de diferentes partes del país desde Lima, estamos por Huancayo, Arequipa, Tacna, Puno, eh, Huachuchuclayo, eh, Cajamarca, Yacucho, todos los administradores, este gran equipo que hace posible que se puedan realizar estos webinars para seguir fortaleciendo nuestra formación profesional y por supuesto, y acá habilitar las camaritas todos, y por supuesto el agradecimiento a cada uno de los ponentes que hacen realidad, que hacen realidad estos webinars, como ha sucedido el día de hoy con nuestro estimado César Pablo. César, realmente muchísimas gracias de corazón. Todas nuestras sesiones son grabadas y he entendido claramente que vas a estar en nuestros próximos webinars. Así que estás súper, hiper comprometido con nosotros. Han quedado encantados con tu presentación, con la información tan valiosa, precisa eh, que has dado con respecto a esta capacidad que para muchos de nosotros realmente no es fácil trabajar. Eh, créeme que para el tema del listening se requiere de algunos recursos y a veces por la realidad de diferentes maestros, porque en el Perú tenemos eh, grandes barreras, ¿no?, entre las ciudades, entre las zonas rurales, entonces el acceso a recursos no es igualitario. Es por eso que para nosotros cada una de estas presentaciones, cada idea que, que cada ponente y el día de hoy, cada idea que has podido compartir con nosotros, para nosotros es oro. Y nosotros lo vamos a aplicar y lo vamos a llevar al aula por eso, y a nombre de toda la comunidad de English Teachers en Perú, te damos este fuerte aplauso a todos los administradores aquí presentes, y por supuesto también en el chat, todos, todos los teachers que han estado conectados. Tal vez tengas algún mensaje que quieras compartir, un mensaje de despedida con la comunidad. Sí, eh, Mariela, eh, Kurt, eh, Ricardo, Sulamita, muchísimas gracias por la invitación. Para mí ha sido un placer, un honor estar reunido con esta comunidad de docentes, de hecho comunidad con la que comparto muchos intereses porque justamente mi interés ya hace bastante tiempo es con mejorar la educación del inglés como lengua extranjera. Eh, aun, aunque en los últimos años lo hago en, digamos, en el, en el ámbito privado, pero eh, mi mirada está también en el ámbito público, ¿no? Y por eso mencioné en el transcurso de la presentación de que como parte de mi investigación del doctorado en educación en la San Marcos, mi enfoque va a ser justamente el lenguaje oral y principalmente la comprensión auditiva. Entonces, eh, hablando de recursos, digamos, buscar la pedagogía más quizás este, interesante por ahí, algo que pueda ayudarnos mejor en los contextos en los cuales vivimos para poder desarrollar esta capacidad. Es cierto que no se puede hacer por la desigualdad de acceso a los recursos que tenemos en, en las diferentes regiones, pero creo que una te la tecnología es una, una herramienta. Compartir ideas, por ejemplo, en este caso, por ejemplo, como Live Listening, que ya está hace mucho tiempo en realidad en muchos libros de pedagogía del inglés como lengua extranjera, puede ayudar muchísimo, ¿no? Eh, porque, porque hay efectivamente contextos en los cuales el recurso es definitivamente un, muy escaso, es un problema en todo caso. ¿no? Eh, para mí ha sido todo un gusto nuevamente eh, colaborar, si por ahí puedo colaborar en algo, con algunas ideas, con algún conocimiento que he podido adquirir en los últimos, en los últimos años de mi vida para poder compartirlo. Finalmente, 
si uno se queda con las ideas, pues uno se termina como implosionando, ¿no? Lo, lo importante de aprender algo nuevo es compartirlo, en, la, en compartirlo justamente, uno en el intercambio en todo caso, confronta esas creencias, las, las mismas que exploramos al comienzo de la presentación, para ver si estoy, digamos, un poquito desfasado quizás, o quizás requiero un poco recambiar algunas ideas, requiero por ahí implementar nuevas estrategias, nuevas ideas que beneficien finalmente a mis estudiantes, ¿no? Creo que el mejor regalo para un docente es que sus estudiantes puedan al final de año agradecerle, no por, lo, por, lo, por la buena gente que ha sido, sino porque realmente ha tenido un impacto en su aprendizaje, un impacto que seguramente como muchos de nosotros nos acordamos de ese docente que de alguna forma impactó en nuestra vida positivamente en algún momento, en mi caso, eh, fue con el idioma inglés en la secundaria, eh, aunque no aprendí nada en realidad, pero eh, un pequeña, una pequeña palabra, un consejo fue suficiente para que posteriormente eh, buscara un camino, ¿no? un camino que no fue fácil ingresar porque primero hay que dominar el inglés para enseñarlo ¿no? y dominarlo a un nivel B1 no es suficiente para enseñar, un nivel B2 es lo mínimo que se requiere, un nivel C1 es aceptable, ¿no? Un nivel C2 es lo que deberíamos aspirar para poder, digamos, compartir ideas ya no solamente en, la, en el país, sino salir, digamos, ir a otros países como, por ejemplo, acceder a becas en el extranjero, en Estados Unidos, Reino Unido y otros lugares para que las puertas eh, se puedan abrir mucho, mucho más con el dominio del idioma inglés. ¿no? Entonces, eh, eso mismo que ahora quizás los profesores de inglés tenemos o que aspiramos tener en todo caso, si es que nuestro nivel de inglés está en B2 por ahí, o B1 actualmente, eh, debemos transmitirlo a los estudiantes, que ellos también logren alcanzar un nivel, digamos, un nivel um, que les permita a ellos finalmente acceder a esas oportunidades que a veces se pierden. Sabemos que hay reportes de que hay muchas becas que vienen del extranjero, se pierden en el camino porque lamentablemente la competencia comunicativa de los estudiantes no está pues para poder llevar un doctorado, una maestría en inglés en esos países, ¿no? A veces uno ganas la beca, pero tienes que prepararte dos años para en inglés, mejorar tu nivel de inglés para recién, digamos, eh, ser acreedor o aceptar la beca. Entonces, pero uno quiere hacerlo ya, ¿no? Quiere llevar esa maestría, quiere, quiere digamos, profundizar en sus conocimientos, en su práctica, en cualquier área de la vida, ¿no? En cualquier carrera, en todo caso. Y a veces la puerta o la limitante es el idioma extranjero. Aunque también, obviamente, hay becas ahí en el extranjero eh, donde que se llevan en idioma ingles, en castellano, pero eh, creo que aquellas que quizás nos interesan más están, eh, digamos, en Brasil, que se dan en portugués, en otros países que se dan en inglés, y queremos justamente, pues, ese idioma extranjero, queremos dominarlo en este caso, ¿no? Llegar a un nivel de proficiencia tan alto que nos permita, pues, comunicarnos con fluidez, con facilidad en diferentes situaciones, tanto formales como casuales o familiares que nos toca afrontar día a día. Entonces, para mí ha sido un gusto estar con ustedes esta tarde, profesores de todo el país, y creo que también o se nos unen profesores de diferentes países, de Ecuador, sí, he escuchado muchos, de Chile, muchos. entonces Ecuador, eh, sí, un abrazo Argentina, fraterno a todos, Ay, y hay que siempre encontrar momentos como estos para compartir, aunque sea en el chat, eh, los he leído por ahí, así es que su voz ha tenido un eco, y eh, cualquier eh, comentario que por ahí haya surgido, lo voy a le releer en todo caso, y procederé a, a profundizar, a investigar y quizás a compartir nuevamente más adelante. Muchísimas gracias con todos. Muchas gracias, César, por ese mensaje lleno de reflexión. Y, y es muy cierto, ¿no? Y en ese sentido creo que todos eh, debemos de reflexionar como maestros, eh, más allá de que sea importante las relaciones interpersonales que se puedan suscitar con nuestros estudiantes, porque también los formamos de manera integral, está el conocimiento disciplinar, que no podemos descuidar, porque nosotros somos maestros del área de inglés, y a veces, muchas veces por diferentes razones, por la la práctica, por el hecho de que muchas veces tenemos en las instituciones públicas, tal vez estudiantes que generalmente siempre están en niveles básicos y demás perdemos la fluencia, pero esa no puede ser excusa para dejar de seguir aprendiendo, preparándonos y recuperando el idioma y su fluencia. Muchas gracias por ese mensaje. Yo sé que todos vamos a reflexionar y darle la importancia que merece 
el idioma, el manejo del idioma para seguir formándonos. Estamos felices con esta presentación y con el impacto que ha tenido en todos los maestros que hasta este momento siguen presentes ahí en el chat de YouTube, escribiendo, mandando saludos, que están en diferentes partes del, del país. Créeme que de zonas eh, bastante inhóspitas y alejadas igual nos siguen. Eh, la comunidad se ha hecho internacional, muchos maestros que están en diferentes partes del mundo. Miles, miles de gracias a todos ustedes. Nos despedimos el día de hoy también, el equipo administrativo, con ustedes, Estado Sulamita Chute, nuestra querida administradora, Kurt Vilela, que le ha dado la suerte a un maestro varón, y ni se quejen que no estuvo presente. Y también a nuestro estimado Ricardo Núñez, de corazón, ahí tiene el logo de nuestra comunidad, y por supuesto a José Ortega, que está detrás de toda la conexión que ha llevado a cabo el sorteo de toda la parte técnica, que en silencio hace un súper trabajo también, apoyándonos en todo y dándonos el soporte. Muchísimas gracias y nos vemos la próxima semana. Bye, bye, English teachers. <música>